today the uh, the presentation is going to be on asymptomatic bacteriuria and an overview of the of the topic we know that that this is a very very common uh, challenge that we have uh, in all form of uh, institutions and elena swingler is one of our uh, pharmacies here at the at the Norton um, and Norton Healthcare, uh, and she's going to give us the the overview uh, today. Any uh, and then after her presentation, we want to have uh, time for comments and questions. Lena, thank you for accepting to give these grand rounds. Please uh, go ahead. Okay. Can everybody see and hear me? Okay. Yes. Okay. Perfect. Yes. So. I am going to start um, start talking about asymptomatic bacteriorrhea um, with a patient case. So I wanted to paint a picture of um, a common scenario that we see in the hospital. Um, so AB is a 70 year old female who presents to the emergency department with hip pain after a fall at home. Um, she's had poor oral intake and has been confused over the past few days. Um, her daughter is with her and she says that she has very bad smelling urine and she always gets like this when she has a UTI. Um, the provider uh, looks over the patient and they find that she has um, normal vitals, lab work, um, and imaging, except for she does have acute kidney injury, as well as high sodium levels. Um, her urinalysis, her urine testing is performed, and they find 20 white blood cells per high power field, which is considered increased. Um, also, large leukocyte esterase and nitrites are present, um, which are all abnormal findings for either inflammation or presence of bacteria. So she's diagnosed with a UTI as well as AKI, and she started on antibiotic IV subtriaxone and IV fluids. So a couple of days into her stay, um, she has this urine culture come back, um, and it is an E. coli organism that is ESBL positive. Um, so that makes uh, this organism pretty resistant, and you can see on the right-hand side is a susceptibility report that one might see um, for something like this. And we can see that one of the antibiotics um, is ceftriaxone, and, and that is exactly what we have her on right now. Um, so sometimes um, the pharmacist would get looped in at this moment to provide a recommendation for treatment um, given the resistant organism. So I wanted to take a step back and talk about what is asymptomatic bacteriorrhea and how common is it? Um, well, the definition is pretty straightforward, um, it, but technically it is the presence of one or more species of bacteria growing in a urine uh, uh, culture that are that is more than um, 100,000 CFU per ml. Um, and this is irrespective of presence of pyuria, which is those white blood cells that I talked about, um, and in the absence of signs and symptoms attributable to a urinary tract infection. So many of the populations that we frequently see in healthcare um, have, are known to have high prevalence of asymptomatic bacteriuria. Um, so the table here lists um, all those that have a 10% or more um, uh, prevalence within that subgroup population. Um, so long-term indwelling urinary catheters, almost 100% of these patients are going to have um, bacteria. Um, spinal cord patients as well, they have ultra-bladder function that predisposes them. Um, also elderly folks at long-term care facilities have high rates. Um, kidney transplants within their first year. And then females in general have um, a greater prevalence than males, um, and particularly elderly females and uh, females with diabetes. So how do we differentiate asymptomatic bacteriuria versus a urinary tract infection or a UTI? And why is this distinction important? Um, well, for asymptomatic bacteriuria or ASB, this is really a microbiological diagnosis. Um, all you need to do is find bacteria in the urine and you have that diagnosis. Um, treatment for this is not recommended except for some select few populations that I'll touch on um, later. Um, in contrast, a UTI is a clinical diagnosis. So identifying that bacteria in the urine supports that diagnosis, but it's really um, the symptoms that make an accurate diagnosis with um, that bacteria. And when, when we're talking about symptoms, um, this is things like 
um, genital urinary symptoms, such as painful urination, increased urinary frequency and urgency, um, or uh, with a more serious infection, fever, flank pain, nausea, and vomiting. For this, we do treat this. This is an infection usually consists of um, treatment of a short course of antimicrobials. So what do the guidelines say about ASB? Um, there's many reputable national and international organizations that agree that screening and treatment of asymptomatic bacteriuria is not recommended unless the patient is pregnant or undergoing an invasive urologic procedure. Um, there's this caveat here because for these populations, there has been a benefit demonstrated um, with treatment of ASB. So for pregnancy, treatment of ASB prevents um, the patient going on to develop pilo or having a premature delivery or infant with low birth weight. Um, and as for uh, GU procedures, um, this specifically applies to procedures that are high risk of mucosal bleeding um, and treatment of ASB prevents um, uh, progression to sepsis in this case. Um, of note, uh, routine Foley catheter exchange is not considered um, one of the procedures um, here for which we need ASB treatment. Um, the second recommendation here, I wanted to highlight pyuria accompanying asymptomatic bacteriuria is not an indication alone for antimicrobial treatment. Um, pyuria can indicate inflammation, but not necessarily infection. Um, it's a poor marker for ruling in or ruling out infection. So why is there such a strong consensus that we should not treat ASB? Um, well, there's been no benefit in multiple randomized controlled trials. In fact, some one trial found that treatment may actually cause harm. Um, it looked at young, healthy women who were treated for asymptomatic bacteriuria and found that they later were at higher risk of developing true infection and um, at higher risk for having resistant organisms. Um, so, of course, resistance, um, adverse drug oh, reactions, and C. difficile infection are um, kind of our consequences that we think of when we use antibiotics. Um, and of note, yeah, patients most likely to have asymptomatic bacteriuria are also the ones that are usually high risk for C. difficile infection. Um, Besides the clinical consequences, there's also economic considerations. So longer hospital length of stay has been associated with treatment of ASB. Um, this can be costly. There's lots of resources that are utilized um, through this process, including urine sample collection, urine sample processing, um, and not to mention drug costs. And this burden is shared by the patient, the healthcare system, as well as third party payers. So from all we've discussed so far, it seems that we know that ASB treatment has no benefit in most populations. We also know that there's harms associated with using antibiotics. So why are we still talking about this? Um, well, despite the mounting evidence, there's still some common misconceptions that prevail in clinical practice that drive some of this mismanagement. Um, the first one here, I think I've mentioned it before, but bacteria growing in the urine alone is not an indication that there is a UTI. Um, another misconception, positive urinalysis is a good predictor for true infection. Um, this is not true. It, is, it is actually has a poor positive predictive value um, and, and positive UAs do not necessitate therapy. Um, cloudy or malodorous urine is indicative of a UTI. This can be a misconception, and, and really patients might say this also. Um, this doesn't correlate well with infection um, and does not count as a symptom um, of a UTI. Uh, falls and confusion in the elderly is usually caused by UTI. Um, this is a, a big one um, and a cause, common reason for hospital admissions we see on a daily basis. Um, there are many reasons why elderly patients may be falling or confused. Um, these reasons include dehydration, medication side effects, um, maybe chronic heart and lung exacerbations, and things like that. Um, and, and guidelines specifically address this misconception and state that elderly patients with confusion who are otherwise clinically stable can really just be observed without antibiotics for a day or two while we look for other causes of that confusion. Um, 
So not only is, is, it, is it not ideal to treat a patient um, in this scenario because of the side effects of antibiotics, but also um, we would be preventing actually um, establishing an accurate diagnosis for, for their falls or confusion. Um, so next one here, if we don't treat ASB, it will progress to a UTI. Um, May, may be a misconception. Um, this is not true. ASB is not associated with long-term um, negative consequences, except um, like I mentioned in the pregnancy and, and GU procedures. Uh, for urine cultures uh, to be repeated after completion of treatment for a UTI, um, this is not recommended. This only increases the risk of identifying ASB. So in terms of characterizing the mismanagement of ASB, who is most at risk for ASB treatment? Um, this table is from an observational study of about of more than 2,000 patients that were hospitalized that were diagnosed with ASB. Um, and they looked at several risk factors and I've divided them into lab specific and patient specific risk factors. Um, so for lab specific risk factors, we see that a positive urinalysis um, patient with that, they have almost three times more likely to get an unnecessary antibiotic for ASB. Um, similar odds ratio for positive urine culture um, and, and leukocytosis is a risk factor as well. Patient characteristics, um, so altered mental status and continence, um, dementia, age, um, with, with an increase every 10 years with, with age, um, increases the risk of treatment. Um, so think um, old, confused ladies with positive urine tests are, are going to be are most um, likely to get treated. So what's clear um, from from this study, I think, and the biggest takeaway is that urine testing really does drive treatment decisions. Um, once a test is ordered and the result is abnormal, whether, whether that's a UA or a urine culture, um, there's a high likelihood that the patient will get antibiotics regardless of their symptoms. So what is the scope of this problem? Um, the pie chart on the left shows results of a cross-sectional study of about 1,500 patients who were being treated for a UTI or a community acquired pneumonia. Um, they found that ASB treatment was responsible for 11% of the overall inappropriate antibiotic use that they identified. Um, the remaining reasons were things like inappropriate drug selection or duration of therapy. Um, 11% is no small number when you consider how many people um, this affects on a, on a daily basis in a hospital. Uh, the chart on the right shows results of a meta-analysis, which looked at 30 studies um, that had patients from various healthcare settings, so emergency departments, hospitals, and outpatient clinics. Um, they found that 45% of those patients that had ASB were treated for it. Um, so almost half of those patients, um, despite their lack of symptoms. So this is a huge proportion considering that that number, that 45% should really be 0%. So how does Norton compare with these findings that we just saw? Um, do we know if it's a problem here at Norton Healthcare? Um, well, infectious disease pharmacists helped a resident conduct a point prevalence study. Um, and basically the objective of this was to assess order patterns of urinalyses and urine cultures on a single day in 2019. Um, so they found on that single day, there were 947 patients admitted to across all facilities. Um, they did not include labor and delivery units. Um, so from, from that total, um, they saw that 54% of them got urine testing. 31% um, of all of the patients had abnormal urinalysis and 14% had an abnormal urine culture. Um, and a subgroup review was conducted um, just of those patients that had abnormal urinalysis or urine culture. Um, they were randomly selected for this review. Um, so they looked at 192 patients here and found that 9% uh, of those patients that had an abnormal urine test um, had antibiotics given, but they also had symptoms reported in the chart. 
Um, so this is um, an appropriate use of antibiotics for UTI. Um, however, 26% of the patients had antibiotics given but had no symptoms documented. Um, so this would be treatment of ASB. Um, and so if we think about um, what we just saw in the previous slide with that meta-analysis that looked at 30 studies, um, they found about 45% treatment um, and we had 26% um, here. So th this, um, this is better, it sounds better, but um, this number, like I said before, really should be 0%. Um, so there's definitely room for improvement. So where specifically in healthcare system is mismanagement of ASB a problem? Um, well, unfortunately, there's no place where ASB goes unnoticed um, because there is reports of inappropriate use across all healthcare settings, including emergency departments, hospitals, long-term care facilities, and clinics. Um, so there's ample opportunity to improve management in all phases of care. So how do we do that? How do we improve this? Um, as I've alluded to, this is a substantial problem um, and many healthcare systems invest in strategies to optimize diagnosis and treatment of ASB and UTI in hopes of preventing some of those negative downstream consequences like resistance, C. difficile, um, adverse drug reactions and costs. Um, so one approach is to discourage overculturing um, and in turn decrease the diagnosis of ASB. Um, so we know that once that bacteria grows on the urine culture, that becomes a risk factor for that patient getting treated despite their lack of symptoms. Um, Norton, for example, um, we recently changed our reflex criteria for our urinalyses. Um, so reflex means that if the UA findings indicate the presence of inflammation or bacteria using certain cutoffs, the lab will automatically culture that sample. Um, so Norton recently changed these cutoffs to make it harder for that UA to reflex. Um, so by doing this, we're hoping to reduce the chance of identifying ASB. Um, something else that can be done, we can encourage appropriate urine collection when it is indicated. Um, so the purpose of this is really to maximize the accuracy of our urine cultures and avoid isolating organisms that are just contaminants. Um, so for example, think about catheters that should be removed before obtaining cultures. Um, otherwise, we would be culturing um, whatever is on that catheter. Um, so nurses are really on the front lines with this, play a big role in our um, quality of the samples that we have. Um, another strategy, clinical decision support. Um, so this just refers to optimizing our electronic health record. So our, the charts that we use for our patients to promote best practices. Um, so for example, at Norton, in the chart, we have a comment on all of our positive blood cultures that have a short and sweet message that says, colonization of the urinary tract is common without infection and treatment is discouraged unless the patient is symptomatic, pregnant, or having an invasive urologic procedure. Um, so this is really a way to provide that in the moment recommendation of how to use the information that the provider sees in the chart. Uh, Something else that we do is antibiotic order review. Um, so this is another strategy at Norton. An ID pharmacist reviews antibiotic orders every day at each hospital. Um, however, there's not enough infectious disease pharmacists to address every single antibiotic and every single case of ASB. Uh, treatment in the whole system, um, but we do focus on inpatients who are on broad spectrum antibiotics, um, which have um, a little bit higher stakes and more consequences um, from their misuse. So lastly, um, education and awareness uh, really is a simple a simple thing that we can do. There's um, lots of misconceptions out there, like I've alluded to. Um, Norton has a top 10 myths position statement um, on our infectious disease uh, pearls page. Uh, we, um, I, I presented those misconceptions that were similar to those earlier. Um, so that's one strategy, just informational guides to guide clinicians. 
Um, but education is not only important for clinicians, but also for patients, since patients themselves may be drivers of some inappropriate treatment. Um, they may be misinformed um, that findings like cloudy urine um, alone indicates infection. Um, so discussions with them about what constitutes as an infection um, can be important. So with that being said, um, I hope we can all agree that for symptom-free pee, we can let it be. Uh, this is a fun graphic, that, and there's many more like it. Um, there's flyers and posters and other educational materials that have been prepared by uh, reputable organizations that are ready, ready to use. Um, so education like this can be an easy way to promote best practices without a huge investment in resources up front like some other interventions might require. So to wrap this up, let's briefly go back to our patient case. Um, we saw that she had a pretty resistant um, E. coli grow on her urine culture. Um, however, if we look at how she's been doing clinically, we find out that um, she was actually already improving over the last couple of days before that urine culture come back came back. Um, so she was improving on her IV fluids and on that antibiotic that was at was not effective if you look at this um, susceptibility pattern. Um, so, so what is happening here? Um, you guessed it, she did not have a UTI and it was just asymptomatic bacteriuria. Um, the most likely explanation for her presentation would be she was probably just dehydrated, um, which made sense with her low oral intake, um, her labs and her response to IV fluids. Um, so in her case, this E. coli should be deemed a colonizer um, and she should not be treated. Um, if we treat this, this would only increase the risk that this organism would become even more resistant. And then when she gets a true infection, we may really be in trouble. Uh, but you can see how this might be hard to ignore. Um, such a scary, resistant looking organism. Um, and, and this is why this increases the risk of patients getting treated. Um, but then again, one could also argue that this patient did not need a urine culture in the first place. So that concludes my presentation. Thank you all for joining. Um, I welcome any questions or discussion. Very good, very good. <clears throat> very, uh, very nice, succinct and and with our goal to maintain the presentation within uh, 30 minutes. Um, this is, uh, again, an, an important uh, topic. We can, <clears throat> see, do we have, um, uh, I see that there's a, uh, well, do we have a, a questions from the audience? Any, um, you can either uh, discuss a question or you can send it a question in the in the chat. I think I see a question from Ruth here. She says, what is currently your biggest concern regarding UTI? Is it culturing practices, delays in removal of indwelling urinary catheters, treatment or MDROs? Um, I, I think, from, from my practice and anecdotally what I've seen, the kind of the problem really comes with those patients who, um, who are in the hospital frequently, whether it be for um, kind of, you know, something urinary, maybe they have a complicated um, anatomy, uh, be it um, or you know, spinal cord injury patients. And I feel like those patients that are here often um, get um, kind of cultured more often and get those um, asymptomatic bacteria treated. Um, so I think from my perspective, those um, kind of more complicated patients that are not as cut and dry are, um, are more of a problem, but certainly there is lots of just um, kind of like more clear, um, their kind of ASB cases as well. Thank you. I know we have some we have some on the call from uh, long term care, and I think you know we we all often talk about the the challenges in long term care and with the elderly 
a patient you at a great case where you know sometimes it's hard to discern uh, those symptoms. So you know if there are anything uh, specific from our long-term care uh, participants, please uh, uh, join in or uh, put some of your comments in the in the chat. Uh, this is a, an opportunity to learn from each other because again, you know they. Uh, patients from long-term care go in and out of the hospital. Uh, so both ways, we are, you know, we're going to be gaining uh, the benefits from uh, or the impact of of a inappropriate treatment. Elena, uh, since uh, obtaining uh, urine cultures in patients that don't have signs or symptoms and it's not uh, recommended. And since with antimicrobial stewardship, now you, you are discussing more and more the concept of also uh, diagnostic stewardship. Uh, <clears throat> then uh, could you uh, emphasize what is that, what, what is what is it you're trying to do with microbiology, trying to prevent, <clears throat> is there any possibility to, to because at the time that the physician ordered a urine analysis of urine culture, um, <clears throat> microbiology doesn't know if the person has signs and symptoms to see. Then if you have fevers, leukocytosis, you may say, well, ordering a urine culture is appropriate. But you don't have fever, you don't have leukocytosis, and, <clears throat> and you just look at the urine, oh, the urine looks a little cloudy. Oh, let me get a urine culture. And, and, but, but then you don't want a urine culture just because quote unquote, the urine looks bad when a patient that is without any change. But how do you, how do you prevent this? Uh, because microbiology still get the urine, it may, as you mentioned, maybe some white blood cells and they, they culture. Any, any, in your discussion with your team, um, how, how do you see, try to resolve this issue? Yeah, so I think that's a very valid point because a lot of um, a lot of mismanagement, like I mentioned, is driven by that positive result once you have it. Um, so there's been a focus in this area, I would say, on diagnostic stewardship specifically. Um, and in terms of Norton Healthcare, um, like I mentioned before, we we just um, recently switched our urinalysis reflex um, criteria as, as a way to hopefully not identify as much ASB. Um, but as far as um, implementing any diagnostic stewardship intervention, I'm not aware that there's anything um, that that we're um, that, that we're in the works of doing right now. Um, but there there have been um, other studies and other centers that have um, approached this with a kind of an indications approach. So um, one would put indications into the order so the provider would have to choose why they're getting that urine culture um, and, and kind of driving uh, practice that way. Um, but uh, this isn't something we've, we've implemented at this point. Because in your presentation, you alluded that, that once you have a folate catheter that is there for a couple of weeks, the, the possibility of culturing bacteria from the urine in a patient with a folate catheter is 100%. Then, mm -hmm. by definition, you always are going to have a positive urine culture. And it's almost like a, if the patient has a, a, a catheter in place, it has to be, I agree with you, it has to be some form of justification, a clinical justification to order a urine culture. Or it's, some, or, or, or it's almost like the, the mag, is there's a urine from the urine culture, it's almost like we need to have a, a feedback mechanism at the, at the, at the hospital, level in microbiology, contacting nursing, or some form of evaluating if the patient really have signs and symptoms compatible with UTI. Yes, I agree. And, and it becomes more tricky with those patients since uh, they may not have the typical symptoms. Um, so you're more relying on those kind of nonspecific, um, like abdominal pain or um, so, some systemic symptoms to, to really figure that out. And that can, that can get very tricky. Can I point out, as the micro person, um, I would love to do that. I would love to be able to have somebody who can look up every specimen when it comes in. But, but you know, we do 400 urine cultures a day. 
So uh, we basically have to assume that somebody who somebody knew what they were doing when they ordered this this culture. Uh, the reflex thing helps. I've never liked reflexes um, because it seems like it's designed to detect asymptomatic bacteria. Uh, what I've always wanted to tell doctors is, you know, if your patient has symptoms, then order a culture, no matter what the UA says. If your patient doesn't have symptoms, then don't order the culture, no matter what the UA says. Uh, that would be the way I would do it. Now, I understand that there are some patients, you know, that can't tell you whether they have symptoms or not. It may be a little harder to figure that out. Um, but possibly putting something in the chart when they order it, where they have to say, this is why I'm ordering it might be able to drive them to have to at least document, yes, this patient has symptoms of the UTI. That's a great, uh, yep, yep. I see there are also a, a couple of comments in the, in the chat. Uh, first, uh, does Norton have a nurse-driven protocol for removing indwelling urinary catheters? And then Sarah had a question about suspicions for asymptomatic bacteria urea. So I'm going to put my email address in the in the chat. So if you have a tool such as this nurse driven protocol, and I know Andrea Flincham developed a number of excellent tools for uh, UTI, this would be um, a time that if you email me, I, I can then return these tools uh, to you, and then I'll put your email address in our uh, constant contact so that um, I can reach out to you and share other, you know, other such tools uh, as we go along. Yeah, I, I think um, I, I wouldn't be able to speak to exactly the uh, nurse driven protocol that we have here. Um, somebody else might be better suited to answer that. But um, in terms of suspicion of ASB, should that be heightened in patients who do not have frequent recurring history of, of UTI? Um, so I think uh, the, I'm not sure about the suspicion of ASB, but uh, we do know uh, even patients who get um, UTIs frequently, um, they can have asymptomatic bacteriuria. Um, and, and like I mentioned, there, there was a study that um, showed that having asymptomatic bacteria may be protective um, in, in terms of getting a recurrence of a UTI. Uh, now, this is only one, um, one or two studies demonstrating this, but um, there, there is that um, thought out there that um, colonization with a less pathogenic um, organism may be beneficial. Um, so I would say um, the frequency of recurrent UTI doesn't um, doesn't necessarily uh, dictate the, the level of suspicion there. And, and I personally have a suspicion when whenever I see that in the medical history that the patient has a history of frequent recurring UTIs, I always wonder, were those actual UTIs or were those ASB? Very interesting topic. Uh, um, and again, it's a it's a, it's a challenge, but the, the fact that you did a study and you have a 25% of close to 200 patients that still, uh, based on your review, were having cases of asymptomatic bacteriuria uh, and they were treated with antibiotics, this means that this is an area that at every level, even at the, uh, and these 200 patients were uh, hospitalized uh, in any of the adult hospitals. Yes. This is 25% in, in hospitalized in acute care. Most likely, the number is going to be even greater in, in long-term care. This is an issue that, that I'm sure I want to keep discussing and trying to develop some form of uh, what, what are the forms of intervention we may need to have in an attempt to, to improve the, the challenge that we have of inappropriate antibiotic use in patients with asymptomatic bacteria. Yes, I think that, that it's um, clear from many institutions' experiences that there's no um, single uh, easy fix for this problem. Um, there's, there's likely going to have to be a multi-intervention multi approach to a problem like this. Very good, very good. Do we have any other um, uh, comments? I noticed that Ruth put in the... 
in the chat that this then this coming uh, Wednesday we are going to discuss the pathophysiology of uh, cater related bloodstream infections as we call it you no know, central line uh, associated bloodstream infection CLAPSI and uh, then this is going to be the the next uh, discussion Wednesday uh, Elena thank you very much for this uh, um, great presentation and, and bring us you know the the challenge of how to move forward to try to resolve this this problem in uh, across all healthcare settings thank you.